Good evening, Dr. Phil here. Today we'll be discussing on rhabdomyolysis. Introduction Rhabdomyolysis is a syndrome caused by injury to skeletal muscle, characterized by skeletal muscle disintegration and leakage of large quantities of potentially toxic intracellular contents into the plasma, such as myoglobin, electrolytes, and intracellular proteins. It is first described in the victims of crush injury during World War II. It is the final pathway of diverse processes and insults. Common causes in adults include abuse of illicit drugs or alcohol, muscular trauma, crush injuries, and myotoxic effects of prescribed drugs. In a pediatric population, common causes include infections, trauma, metabolic conditions, and muscle diseases. 60% of cases of rhabdomyolysis have multiple contributing factors. Statistics in developed countries Overall mortality for patients with rhabdomyolysis is about 5%. Risk of death for any single patient is dependent on the underlying etiology and existing comorbid conditions. The incidence of rhabdomyolysis increases after the onset of wars or natural disasters. Incidence of myoglobin-induced acute kidney injury in adult rhabdomyolysis is 17-35%. to 35%. Rhabdomyolysis causes 5 to 20% of adult cases of AKI. 28 to 37% of adult patients require short-term hemodialysis. The presentation ranges from asymptomatic to life-threatening with hyperkalemia and acute kidney injury. Causes of rhabdomyolysis can be divided into traumatic and non-traumatic causes. Traumatic causes. Crush injury and trauma, for example, due to road traffic accidents, earthquakes, collapsed buildings, blunt trauma, and arterial cut causing ischemia. Prolonged muscle compression, for example due to prolonged immobilization, alcohol associated, illicit drug use associated, stroke, coma, or prolonged surgery, prolonged tonique use, and perioperative. In the context of anesthesia or surgery, prolonged muscle compression can occur due to prolonged immobility, tonicase, non-invasive arterial pressure cuffs, poor perioperative positioning, compression of muscle at pressure points, etc. Prolonged muscle compression during surgery may be undetected due to anesthesia or analgesia, which masks the symptoms of pain, paresthesia, and sympathetic activation. Compartment syndrome causes includes prolonged muscle compression, fractures, trauma, hemorrhage, intensive muscle use, burns and venomation, reduced serum osmolarity, post-ischemic edema, myositis, vasculitis, androgen abuse, DVT, and iatrogenic. Increased compartment pressures results in reduced tissue perfusion and muscle injury and further ischemia, damage, and necrosis. Prolonged elevated intracompartmental pressure results in irreversible peripheral nerve injury as well. Extensive burns and electrocution can cause rhabdomyolysis. Non-traumatic causes of rhabdomyolysis Drugs and toxins Drugs may cause rhabdomyolysis by narcotic and sedative hypnotic overdose resulting in immobilization for extended periods, pressure necrosis and rhabdomyolysis. Drugs can reduce skeletal muscle ATP production or increase skeletal muscle ATP consumption. Drugs can cause direct sarcolemmal injury, which is often mediated by activation of phospholipase A. Substance abuse, such as ethanol, methanol, ethylene glycol, isopropanolol, heroin, methadone, cocaine, barbiturates, amphetamine, ketamine, fencyclidine, ecstasy, and LSD, etc., can cause rhabdomyolysis. Ethanol induces damage to sarcolemma, resulting in myopathy and non-traumatic rhabdomyolysis. Alcohol abuse is also associated with other conditions that can cause rhabdomyolysis. For example, alcohol-associated immobility results in muscle compression and muscle ischemia, which causes rhabdomyolysis. Hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, alcohol withdrawal, delirium tremens, and seizures are associated with rhabdomyolysis. Chronic alcohol abuse causes muscles to be susceptible to rhabdomyolysis. With regards to cocaine, Cocaine can directly damage muscle tissue by causing vasoconstriction and tissue ischemia. 
Several medications can cause rhabdomyolysis, for example, statins, antihistamines, salicylates, caffeine, fibric acid derivatives such as benzafibrate, cofibrate, phenofibrate, and gemfibrozil, neuroleptics or antipsychotics, anesthetics and paralytic agents associated with malignant hyperthermia, amphotericin B, quinine, corticosteroids, colchicine, thiophylline, cyclic antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, aminocaproic acid, continuous infusion of propofol, and protease inhibitors. Statins are 3 hydroxy 3 methylglutaryl coenzyme A reductase inhibitors. They impair mitochondrial function and electron transport chain. This results in reduced ATP. Statins affect the ubiquitin proteosome pathway gene expression, and this alters the balance between protein repair and degradation. Statins deplete isoprenoids and coenzyme Q10. Rhabdomyolysis occurs in 1.5 per 100,000 statin prescriptions. Fatal rhabdomyolysis occurs in less than 1 per million prescriptions. The risk appears higher in adults with complex medical problems and medication use. Statins appear safe when used in children with hypercholesterolemia. Sarivastatin has been withdrawn in 2001 as the rate of rhabdomyolysis is 16 to 80 times higher than other statins. Environmental toxins that can cause rhabdomyolysis include carbon monoxide, toluene, hemlock herbs from quail, venom from snake, spider, hornet, or Africanized honeybees, and iron dextran, also known as cosmopher. Infection or sepsis can cause rhabdomyolysis. Viral-induced myositis can be caused by influenza, HIV, EBV, Kosaki virus, echovirus, cytomegalovirus, adenovirus, herpes, parainfluenza, varicella zoster, West Nile, and COVID-19. Viruses cause rhabdomyolysis by directly attacking the muscle or by generating muscle-specific toxin. Other pathogens that can cause rhabdomyolysis includes any microbe that causes sepsis and toxic shock. The Legionella species are the bacterium classically associated with rhabdomyolysis in adults. They directly invade muscle and cause toxic degeneration of muscle fibers. Other bacteria that can cause rhabdomyolysis include Plasmodium, Francisella, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Escherichia coli, Borrelia, Clostridium, Viridans, Brickettsia, Salmonella, Listeria, Mycoplasma, Vibrio, Brucella, Bacillus, Leptospira, Candida, and Aspergillus. Ischemia, for example, caused by vascular obstruction or hypoxia, can cause rhabdomyolysis. Causes of vascular obstruction include thrombus, prolonged arterial clamping, tonique, compartment syndrome, prolonged muscle compression, sickle cell crisis, etc. Hypoxia can be caused by respiratory failure, for example, status asthmaticus, near drowning or carbon monoxide poisoning. Hypoxia can be caused by shock and post-CPR. Overexertion can cause rhabdomyolysis, for example, strenuous exercises, seizures, status epilepticus, severe dystonia, acute psychosis, excessive computer, keyboard use or gaming. Factors that increase the risk of exertional rhabdomyolysis and renal failure include dehydration, use of nutritional supplements, drug use, sickle cell trait, and malignant hypothermia. Changes in body temperature can cause rhabdomyolysis, such as during heat stroke, malignant hyperthermia, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, hypothermia, etc. Metabolic and electrolyte disorders such as hyponatremia, hypernatremia, hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, non-ketotic hyperosmotic state, and diabetic ketoacidosis can cause rhabdomyolysis. Rheumatologic disorders or inflammatory myopathies such as polymyositis, dermatomyositis, Sjogren's syndrome, mixed connective tissue disease, SLE, and abnormal skeletal muscle relaxation disorders can cause rhabdomyolysis. Genetic defects. Affected muscles are unable to produce or use ATP appropriately this results in mismatch of energy supply and demand and disruption of cell membranes during exercise. Any inherited condition that impairs energy delivery to muscle may cause rhabdomyolysis. For example, diseases of glucose, 
glycogen, fatty acid, or nucleoside metabolism. They often present in childhood. Suspect these conditions in recurrent cases of myoglobinuria and rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis in these states may be exacerbated by exertion or during fasting. Rhabdomyolysis may be idiopathic. Pathophysiology The final common pathway for the above-mentioned causes of rhabdomyolysis is the disruption of the sarcolemma and release of intracellular myocyte components. The sarcolemma is a thin membrane that encloses striated muscle fibers. It contains numerous ATP-dependent ion pumps that regulate cellular electrochemical gradients, such as the sodium-potassium adenosine triphosphate pump, which maintains intracellular sodium concentration at 10 MEq per liter. It actively transports sodium from the interior of the cell to the exterior. The cell interior becomes more negatively charged than the exterior, and an electrochemical gradient is formed. This gradient pulls sodium into the cell interior in exchange for calcium through a protein carrier exchange mechanism. An active calcium exchanger promotes calcium entry into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria. Mechanisms of cell destruction in rhabdomyolysis includes sarcolemic injury and depletion of ATP within the myocyte. Sarcolemic injury may be caused by trauma, toxins, drugs infection, temperature changes, inflammation, and electrolyte abnormalities. In inflammation, muscle damage is amplified by infiltration of activated neutrophils. Excess fluid may accumulate within affected muscle tissue. Inflammatory cascade and reperfusion injury sustains muscle damage and degeneration. In electrolyte abnormalities, for example, during hyponatremia, there is dysfunction of the sodium-calcium pump, and this results in activation of proteases and lipases, which causes cell lysis. Depletion of ATP within the myocyte may be caused by ischemia, overexertion, genetic disorders, metabolic disorders, and electrolyte imbalances. For example, hypophosphatemia results in reduced ATP production. ATP depletion results in impairment of ATP-dependent ionic pumps, such as the calcium ATPase pumps, and this results in disruption of cellular transport mechanisms, alteration of electrolyte composition, loss of ionic gradients across cell membranes, and increased intracellular calcium. Increased intracellular calcium results in persistent contraction of the myofibril, further ATP depletion, activation of calcium-dependent proteases and phospholipases, increased free oxygen radicals, degradation of myofilaments and membrane phospholipid, resulting in leakage of intracellular contents into the plasma, disintegration of the myocyte, rhabdomyolysis, metabolic derangements, and AKI. Metabolic derangements of rhabdomyolysis. Myocyte injury results in release of intracellular contents into the circulation, producing hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hyperuricemia due to metabolism of purines from disintegrated cell nuclei, increased CK, and increased serum myoglobin. There's risk of arrhythmias due to hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, and acidosis. Hypocalcemia is due to hyperphosphatemia, resulting in calcium phosphate deposition in soft tissue, reduced 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol in patients with renal failure, and due to calcium loss from the serum by entering damaged muscle. Hypocalcemia may lead to arrhythmias, muscle contractions, and seizures. Hypercalcemia occurs in one-third of patients during recovery from rhabdomyolysis due to release of vitamin D stores from injured muscles, which is a substrate for the production of excess 125-dihydroxyvitamin D3. Calcium leakage from damaged muscles and poor calcium clearance if AKI occurs. Hypercalcemia may be exacerbated by iatrogenic administration of calcium used to correct acute hypocalcemia. Lactic acidosis occurs due to anaerobic metabolism of the ischemic muscle by converting pyruvate to lactate. Hypoalbuminemia results from proteinuria and direct leakage of protein in the kidneys. Myoglobin is a dark red heme-containing protein that stores and transports oxygen in muscle. Normally, only low levels of myoglobin are present in the plasma. 
Myoglobin is bound to plasma proteins and very little crosses through the glomerulus normally. Myoglobin has a small molecular weight and is easily filtered in the kidneys. During rhabdomyolysis, there is increased release of myoglobin into the circulation. Renal threshold for free myoglobin is exceeded and myoglobinuria occurs. Acute kidney injury. Incidence of AKI after rhabdomyolysis may be as high as 65%. If AKI develops, it is often 12 to 72 hours after the initial muscle damage. Rhabdomyolysis induced AKI mechanisms includes intrarenal vessel constriction, direct and ischemic tubular injury, and tubular obstruction. Intrarenal vessel constriction, hypovolemia, for example due to volume loss or third spacing to damaged tissues, activation of renin angiotensin system, and additional vascular mediators results in renal vessel constriction, reduced renal blood flow, and pre-renal AKI. Scavenging effect of myoglobin in the renal microcirculation results in reduced vasodilator nitric oxide, increased renal vessel constriction and AKI. Renal vessel constriction and ischemia deplete tubular ATP formation and enhances tubular cell damage. Direct and ischemic tubular injury can be caused by increased lipid peroxidation due to the heme proteins of myoglobin which results in cytotoxicity. Ferrihemate and globin are the breakdown products of myoglobin, which forms when urine pH is less than 5.6. Ferrihemate contains iron, which is free to accept and donate electrons. This produces free radicals, which causes direct nephrotoxicity, often through lipid peroxidation. Heme proteins may also affect nitrous oxide, endothelin receptors, and cytokines. Tubular obstruction Myoglobin interacts with the protein TAM horsepower within renal tubules. This results in formation of brown granular casts, which obstructs renal tubules. This process is favored when the urine is acidic. Myoglobin may have no nephrotoxic effect when the urine is alkaline. Uric acid crystals due to hyperuricemia can also cause renal tubular obstruction. Predictors for development of AKI in rhabdomyolysis includes peak CK level more than 6,000 international units per liter. However, AKI has occasionally developed in severely dehydrated patients with peak CK as low as 2,000 international units per liter. Dehydration, sepsis, hyperkalemia or hyperphosphatemia on admission, and hypoalbuminemia are predictors for development of AKI in rhabdomyolysis. Severe AKI due to rhabdomyolysis is associated with increased volume depletion, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hyperuricemia, increased anion gap, increased length of hospital stay, and increased need for dialysis. Gastrointestinal ischemia is common in patients with fluid and electrolyte imbalances. This can lead to endotoxin absorption, cytokine production, and perpetuation of the systemic inflammatory response. Presentation History A classical triad of muscle weakness, myalgias, and dark urine is seen in only about 50% of adult patients and it may be even less common in children. General symptoms include malaise, fatigue, fever, nausea vomiting, suspect rhabdomyolysis in the presence of precipitating factors, traumatic precipitating factors include crush injury, road traffic accidents, fractures, muscle compression, immobility, electrocution, tonicase, burns, etc. Non-traumatic precipitants include alcohol, substance abuse, drugs, toxins, symptoms of infection, symptoms of vascular occlusion, hypoxic events, symptoms of compartment syndrome, strenuous exercise, seizures, changes in body temperature, symptoms of metabolic or electrolyte disorders, genetic disorders, inflammatory myopathies, rheumatological disorders, etc. Regarding the affected limb or muscle, take note of the distribution. Is it localized or diffuse? Take note of weakness, myalgia, swelling, limited movement, and neurological deficits. The urine may be red or brown, and there may be oliguria. Symptoms of complications of rhabdomyolysis may be present, such as AKI, 
electrolyte abnormalities, compartment syndrome, DIVC, etc. Examination Assess vital signs and signs of precipitating factors, such as crush injuries or deformities in long bones, signs of compartment syndrome, skin changes consistent with pressure necrosis, altered sensorium from drug abuse, seizures, signs of sepsis, signs of hypoxia, hyperthermia or hypothermia, signs of vascular occlusion, electrical injuries, and burns. Assess the affected muscle or limb. Take note of the distribution. Assess for signs of trauma or compartment syndrome, weakness, tenderness, swelling, limited movements, neurological deficits, and assess perfusion. The urine may be red or brown. There may be oliguria. Assess for signs of complications of rhabdomyolysis. The patient may present without any obvious history or physical signs of rhabdomyolysis. The patient may be initially clinically normal or be normalized after fluid resuscitation only to deteriorate hours later as the condition progresses. Clinicians must be aware of the potentially subtle presentation and keep the possibility of rhabdomyolysis in mind. Regular observations are needed to detect any deterioration promptly. Failure to consider rhabdomyolysis can result in complications. Investigations Serum creatine kinase is typically more than 5,000 units per liter, which is five times its normal upper limit. Serum CK is the most reliable and sensitive indicator of muscle injury. Serum CK is a more reliable marker of rhabdomyolysis than serum or urine myoglobin. Although myoglobin levels peak before increases in CK, myoglobin is metabolized rapidly at sites outside of the kidney, and this decreases myoglobin levels. Serum CK is easier to detect. Serum CK is predominantly the skeletal muscle MM rather than the myocardial MB fraction. If increased CKMB occurs, this represents the small amount found in skeletal muscle or may be due to cardiac injury. Serum CK is present in the serum immediately after muscle injury. Risk of renal injury is low when the initial CK level is less than 15,000 to 20,000 units per liter. However, lower CK levels may lead to renal injury in patients with sepsis, dehydration, or acidosis. Initial CK levels are related to progression to AKI and mortality at 30 days. Serum CK rises within 12 hours of muscle injury and typically peak between 24 and 72 hours after the onset of rhabdomyolysis. Repeat serum CK every 6 to 12 hours to determine the peak CK level. The peak CK level is sensitive but a non-specific marker for rhabdomyolysis. CK levels 5 times above the reference range suggest rhabdomyolysis. CK levels in rhabdomyolysis may be 100 times the reference range or even higher. Suspect early rhabdomyolysis in patients with serum CK levels 2 to 3 times the reference range in the presence of risk factors for rhabdomyolysis. The serum half-life of CK is about 36 hours. Serum CK decreases at a rate of 30 to 40% per day if muscle injury resolves. CK levels decline 3 to 5 days after the resolution of muscle injury. If serum CK is increased beyond 24 to 72 hours, consider compartment syndrome or ongoing muscle injury. Serum or urine myoglobin may be present. Myoglobin may be measured directly. However, this measurement is not offered by all laboratories. Plasma myoglobin measurements are not reliable. As myoglobin has a half-life of 1 to 3 hours, myoglobin is cleared from the plasma within 6 hours. Serum myoglobin not measured at the right time may produce a false negative result, although a positive result may help confirm the diagnosis. Urine myoglobin measurements are therefore preferable to plasma myoglobin measurement. Myoglobinuria is detectable when serum myoglobin exceeds the renal threshold of 0.5 to 1.5 mg per dl. Myoglobinuria is visible as reddish brown urine when concentration exceeds 100 mg per dl. Urine dipstick is positive for blood, but has absent red blood cells in myoglobinuria. Myoglobinuria may be sporadic or resolve early in the course of rhabdomyolysis. Myoglobinuria may be undetectable by the time urine levels are tested. Because serum myoglobin levels peak early, 
and myoglobin is metabolized rapidly. The assay used to detect myoglobinuria is insensitive. Absence of myoglobinuria does not exclude rhabdomyolysis. In a study of 475 patients with rhabdomyolysis diagnosed by raised CK, myoglobinuria was only detected in 19% of the patients. Urine dipstick findings are positive in less than 50% of patients with rhabdomyolysis. Urinary dipstick may be positive for blood. Urinary dipstick for blood is positive in the presence of myoglobin. This is far more frequently present than a positive assay for myoglobinuria. Sensitivity is 81% for the detection of rhabdomyolysis. False positives can occur if urinary red cells are present. This impairs the reliability, especially in trauma cases. Urinary dipstick is a rapid bedside test and can be used for serial assessment for the resolution of myoglobinuria, which is a useful endpoint for fluid resuscitation. Serum urea and creatinine may be increased. Conversion of liberated muscle creatine to creatinine results in increased serum creatinine to urea ratio. The normal ratio is approximately 10 micromole to 1 millimole. Serum urea and creatinine helps in the diagnosis of AKI. AKI is an abrupt, within 48 hours, decrease in renal function that is clinically significant, i.e. can have adverse consequences. The acute kidney injury network criteria for AKI is increased serum creatinine of 0.3 mg per dl or more within 48 hours or increased serum creatinine of 50% or more within 48 hours or reduced urine output to less than 0.5 mL per kg use ideal body weight for more than 6 hours. Serum potassium may be increased, which occurs within hours of onset of rhabdomyolysis. Hyperkalemia occurs in 10-40% to 40 of cases and is an immediate threat to life due to cardiac arrhythmias. Serum calcium may be reduced in the acute phase and increased in the late phase. ECG is useful to diagnose complications such as hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia-induced arrhythmias and myocardial infarction. Serum phosphate and uric acid may be increased. Blood gases may show lactic acidosis. Blood gases allows monitoring of trends in pH and serum lactate, which is a useful guide to fluid resuscitation. pH, base excess and potassium levels are useful to assess the need for renal replacement therapy. An ion gap is increased. Coagulation studies may be prolonged if severe such as in disseminated intravascular coagulation. Thromboplastin released from injured myocytes causes the IVC. Other investigations to consider. Radiography for suspected fractures, complete blood count, liver function tests, measurement of compartment pressures. Measure compartment pressures in any patient with severe focal muscle tenderness and firm muscle compartment. If it is more than 25 to 30 mmHg, fasciotomy may be indicated. Serum aldolase is increased in muscle diseases such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, and limb girdle dystrophy. Lactate dehydrogenase, LDH, is found in almost all body cells and is involved in energy production. Increased LDH usually indicates tissue damage. Cardiac troponin I, in one series of 109 ED patients with rhabdomyolysis, 50% had an elevated cardiac troponin I level, 58% were true positives based on ECG and echocardiography, 33% were false positives, and 9% were indeterminate. CT head, cervical spine, or CT abdomen may be required to assess for traumatic injuries. MRI is used in the assessment of myopathy polymyositis, dermatomyositis, bacterial myositis, focal myositis, idiopathic rhabdomyolysis, and muscle injury. MRI is the imaging modality of choice for evaluating the distribution and extent of muscle injury, especially when fasciotomy or involvement of deep compartments is considered. Muscle biopsy may be used to assess myopathy or inherited muscle diseases. Immunoblotting Immunofluorescence and genetic studies are used in assessment of genetic disorders. 
management. Initiate early resuscitation according to ALS protocol. Assess and provide supportive care as needed. Diagnose and resuscitate simultaneously. Stabilize the patient and address life and limb threatening conditions. Patient transfer if required once the patient is stabilized, for example, to locations that can provide dialysis services or intensive care. Early fluid resuscitation is the most important measure in preventing myoglobinuric AKI. Obtain IV access with large ball catheter and initiate fluid resuscitation as soon as possible. Support intravascular volume to increase GFR, oxygen delivery, and dilute myoglobin and other renal tubular toxins. Evidence-based. Retrospective studies of patients with severe crush injuries resulting in rhabdomyolysis discovered that prognosis is better when pre-hospital personnel provides fluid resuscitation. No randomized trials of fluid repletion regimens in any age group have been done. Choice of IV fluids depends on their pros and cons. For example, normal saline does not contain potassium and this does not worsen hyperkalemia. However, there is a risk of hyperchloremic acidosis. Hartman solution may aid in urinary alkalinization. However, Hartman's contains potassium and this may worsen hyperkalemia. Sodium bicarbonate 1.26% avoids hyperchloremic acidosis induced by normal saline and aids in urinary alkalinization. With regards to the amount of IV fluids, injured myocytes can sequester large volumes of extracellular fluid. This results in volume depletion and crystalloid requirements may be surprisingly large. In adults, administer isotonic fluids at about 400 mL per hour initially. Initial flow rate may be up to 1 liter per hour based on the type of condition and severity. Afterwards, titrate IV fluids to maintain a urine output of at least 200 mL per hour in adults. If persistent anuria, consider correcting reversible causes, diuretics, and renal replacement therapy. In the pediatric population, few studies of fluid repletion regimens are available. Administer isotonic fluids at 20 mL per kg initially. Subsequent hydration at a level of 2 to 3 times maintenance may be sufficient. Methods to monitor fluid status and guide fluid resuscitation. The target urine output is 3 mL per kg per hour or 300 mL per hour. Catheterize the bladder for accurate monitoring. Consider arterial blood pressure and CVP measurement. When to taper down volume resuscitation and induced polyuria. When myoglobinuria is cleared, for example, negative urinary dipstick for blood, or when CK levels are reduced. Identify and correct inciting causes of rhabdomyolysis. Discontinue any myotoxic agents. Treat fractures, trauma, infection, toxin, etc. Treatment of electrolyte derangements. Hyperkalemia is life-threatening, treat promptly, monitor potassium levels closely along with ECG. Treatment options include 10 mL IV 10% calcium gluconate, IV insulin 10 international unit in 50 mL of 50% dextrose over 15 minutes, nebulized salbutamol 10 mg, oral or rectal sodium polystyrene sulfonate, and hemodialysis. Hypocalcemia Early hypocalcemia should not be treated unless symptomatic, for example, dysrhythmias or seizures occurring, or as a treatment of hyperkalemia. Normal calcemia usually occurs spontaneously. Hypercalcemia may develop during the recovery phase, especially if there is acute kidney injury. Hyperphosphatemia is rarely of clinical significance and rarely requires treatment. If treatment is required, this is achieved by alkaline diuresis. Hyperuricemia is rarely of clinical significance and rarely requires treatment. Uricosuric agents or allopurinol are not indicated. Compartment syndrome. Prompt diagnosis is important. Suspect if the limb is tender or extremely painful and peripheries are cool and there is pain on passive extension. Loss of peripheral pulses and tense muscles are late signs. Compartment pressures should be measured when significant muscle injury has occurred. Relief of compartmental pressures can be done by removing dressings, cusps, or rubble at trauma scenes. Urgent fasciotomy, especially if intracompartmental pressure exceeds 30 mmHg. Fasciotomies 
may result in major blood loss. Transfuse blood products if necessary. Provide supplemental oxygen, analgesia, treat hypotension to improve perfusion. Amputation may be done if the limb is dead. Close monitoring of vital signs, serial CK, hourly urine output, and watch out for rhabdomyolysis and AKI. Intensive care. High-risk patients with multiple injuries require critical care. Serial physical examinations and lab studies are indicated to monitor for complications of rhabdomyolysis such as compartment syndrome, hyperkalemia, renal failure, DIVC, and cardiac failure. Resolution of rhabdomyolysis can be done by assessing serial CK levels. Most survivors recover good renal function. Urine alkalinization. Indications include for patients with rhabdomyolysis and CK levels exceeding 6,000. Consider early urine alkalinization in patients with acidemia, dehydration, or underlying renal disease. Target urine pH is 6.5. Advantages, there is reduced precipitation of TAM horsepower protein complexes in alkaline urine. Disadvantages, reduced ionized calcium results in worsening of hypocalcemia. Urinary alkalinization can be done by IV sodium bicarbonate boluses of 50 to 100 millimoles or as 1.26% to aid in volume resuscitation. Evidence base. Robust evidence for the use of sodium bicarb as a therapy to prevent AKI in rhabdomyolysis is lacking. Evidence for the use of urine alkalinization is mostly from animal studies and retrospective adult studies. There is no supporting evidence in pediatric literature regarding urine alkalinization. Diuretics. Options include mannitol and furosemide. Benefits of mannitol include increased flushing of nephrotoxic agents through the renal tubules, increased extraction of fluid that has accumulated in injured muscles. Mannitol acts as a free radical scavenger. Risk. Mannitol may exacerbate hypovolemia, thus its use should be reserved during normal volemia and reduced urine output. Monitoring response to therapy is via urine output, plasma osmolarity and osmolar gap. Discontinue mannitol if there is no improvement in urine output or osmolar gap increases to more than 55 mOsm per kg. Furosemide may be used to increase urinary output in patients who are oliguric despite adequate intravascular volume. Aggressive volume expansion should be maintained until myoglobinuria is cleared. Evidence base. Evidence for the use of mannitol or other diuretics as therapy to prevent AKI in rhabdomyolysis is lacking. Renal replacement therapy may be required to treat oliguric renal failure, persistent hyperkalemia despite therapy, other electrolyte abnormalities, persistent metabolic acidosis, and volume overload such as in pulmonary edema and congestive heart failure. Consultations to consider includes nephrologists, for patients who have significant rhabdomyolysis, renal failure and requiring dialysis. Neurologists, for patients who have new onset seizures or status epilepticus. Orthopedic surgeon, for patients who have fractures or compartment syndrome. Poison control center, for patients who have drug overdose or envenomation. Geneticist or metabolism specialist, for patients who have suspected genetic or metabolic diseases. Rheumatologist, for patients who have suspected inflammatory myopathies, SLE, sarcoidosis, etc. DIVC, treat with fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, platelet transfusion, and treat the underlying cause. Free radical scavengers and antioxidants, such as pantoxifilin, vitamin E, and vitamin C. Controlled studies evaluating the efficacy of these agents have not been performed, and their clinical use remains unclear. Outpatient management. Consider outpatient management in patients who have good hydration, stable vital signs, normal renal function, normal electrolyte levels, alkaline urine, isolated cause of muscle injury, and no indication for inpatient treatment. Continue monitoring as outpatients. No specific outpatient medications are needed if adequate hydration is ensured. Stop inciting myotoxic agents. 
communicate with primary care or outpatient specialty physicians regarding diagnostic genetic tests during inpatient stay, if any. Genetic counselling is indicated for family members with inherited muscle enzyme and energy substrate deficiencies. Lifestyle-related treatment measures Patient education for causes and prevention of rhabdomyolysis Avoid preventable inciting causes of rhabdomyolysis whenever they are identified. Substance abuse Avoid alcohol, narcotics, sedative, hypnotics and other drugs known to cause immobilization. Mental health and drug rehab services should be offered to individuals with substance use disorders. High-risk behavior should be avoided if it causes trauma. Physical exertion. Caution patients that enhanced exertional activity can cause rhabdomyolysis, particularly in untrained individuals. Reduce or avoid if physical exertion precipitates recurrent myogias, myopathy or rhabdomyolysis. Individuals with recurrent rhabdomyolysis due to exertion require further medical evaluation. Maintain adequate hydration during strenuous exercise. Heat exhaustion. Educate patients signs of dehydration and heat-related injuries. Educate patients to pay careful attention to hydration and external methods of cooling. Avoid hot and humid conditions if it precipitates heat exhaustion. Seizure and asthma medications. Compliance with these medications may reduce status epilepticus and status asthmaticus which can cause rhabdomyolysis. Dietary modifications may help improve symptoms of certain metabolic disorders or inborn errors of metabolism. For example, in phosphorylase deficiency, dietary supplementation with glucose or fructose may reduce pain and fatigue. In carnitine palmitotransferase deficiency, frequent meals and a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet may reduce myalgia and myoglobinuria. Dietary modification does not help in phosphofructokinase deficiency and phosphoglycerate mutase deficiency. These are my references. Thank you.